So, uh, welcome everyone. My name is Jan Lachmann. I'm a PhD student in the Network and Equality Group here at the Complex Design Lab. Um, and today I have the pleasure uh, of introducing to you Sandro Sousa. Uh, for our next installment of our Network and Equality uh, lecture series, Sandro is by training a computer scientist, if I'm not mistaken. And he's working on a very wide range of topics, ranging from spatial complexity all the way to population dynamics. Uh, currently, Sandra is doing a postdoc at the group of uh, Networks, Data, and Society, or short NERDS, uh, at the University of Copenhagen. Uh, and there he is, um, as far as I'm aware, working on algorithm experiments and science of science. Um, he has done some work on uh, social segregation, comparing cities of London and uh, Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo. Uh, and he did his PhD in complex systems at the School of Mathematical Sciences at Queen Mary University. Um, and I think uh, today he's going to present his work from that time. So please take it away. All right. Uh, let me see if this is working. Yes. Um, Thank you for the kind uh, introduction. Uh, computer science is one of the hats that I that I take, but I often call myself a pirate. I just jump from department to department and get the the great methods and the ways they do things, like from geography to math and computer science. So uh, I think that's a better description, at least the one that I found so far. But yeah, so this is the work that I I develop with my uh, former supervisor, Vincenzo Nicosia at Queen Mary, University of London for my uh, PhD. We, we did some applications of that as well uh, later on. Uh, yeah, and I'm super happy to be here and uh, share some of my work with you. And hopefully we can make a discussion uh, at the end and talk about it, talk about better ways to, uh, to measure segregation and quantify segregation uh, and so on. So I will try to make the, the talk shorter so we have more time for questions and interaction instead of just you listening to me here uh, non-stop all right so the the main idea today is to talk about how to quantify uh spatial heterogeneity which is the way that people tend to um be distributed in space and we use uh, a diffusion process on uh, cities to kind of develop this kind of thing but first I think it's important to understand why this matters, right? I guess, I mean, everyone here would agree that cities, they are, they are fascinating. They are kind of, um, we could also agree that they are kind of the future of humanity because our population is shifting more and more towards urban spaces and we are becoming more and more forced to share these spaces and share resources. So the, the, the whole way the cities are organized, especially uh, spatially shapes a lot how we interact with who we interact, uh, it has a lot of interactions uh, related to uh, where we live, uh, economical activities, and so on. And uh, and cities are amazing. They are super complex. They are super hard to measure and super hard to to quantify. But cities also have um, issues. Some of them and this kind of stuff that you see here. This is a a, a community in uh, in in Brazil where you have you have this very sharp. Um, division between insanely wealthy uh, condominium and um, a very uh, subdeveloped uh, living structure here on the other side. And the only thing separating them is, is this line of a wall. And it's crazy that if you look at the average income of this area, this whole thing here, you push the income much higher, but there are people living at very miserable conditions at the, at, at the other side. And the whole idea of doing this kind of study is that we can quantify those issues. We can tell where those issues are. That's why space is important. So hopefully we can make policymakers listen to us and implement some of those learnings in, uh, in their policies. And, and ultimately to somehow try to reduce inequalities in these cities and support those most vulnerable individuals that they often don't have um, a voice. Right, so the way we do that is using uh, random walks on networks. I will give a few more details later, but the whole idea is that we start with a city where we look at the, the, the planar projection of this city, which is a map. And here you have the, the neighborhoods. These neighborhoods can be divided in very different ways, depending on the city where you look, like smaller areas, larger areas. 
and they are and they are connected. They share a border. That's what I mean by adjacency. Of course, you can look at different structures as well in the way they are connected. But in this example here, I will focus on adjacency. And from this structure, from this topology of the network, this planar representation of the network, we can develop the the network where the neighborhoods are the nodes, and they are connected pretty much if they have uh, if they share a border. So this is a, a very typical planar graph. And this is just one of the ways of representing this kind of space. You can also look at network intersections as well. You can look at some distance function to connect these two areas. And in this example here, we use this one because it's where data is mostly available and you can extract data with this format from almost most sensors uh, in the world today. And then from, from this starting point, the whole idea is that you have um, um, a random walk exploring this city and this, this random walk is pretty much one, uh, let's say it could be one person, could be anything uh, starting one, one neighborhood, which is this uh, node here in, in blue. And then by jumping from node to node or from neighborhood to neighborhood, you kind of get a gist of what the structure of the city looks like, especially when you have some, uh, some attribute assigning to, to these nodes. And the whole idea here is that um, in the case of adjacency and in the case of, let's say, ethnicities assigned to the groups, this random walk will give you the time series of the ethnicities visited uh, at each time step. So if you start with this caller here assigned to this neighborhood, that's the one you visit first and then the next one, and you can count uh, how, how long it takes to find all the possible groups. Uh, of course, here I'm using the example of just a single label where you can assign the whole distributions to this neighborhood and you look at the whole distribution and that you tell how the kind of how the population is, uh, is distributed in, in, in this city. Uh, and as I mentioned, ethnicity is one example where you can also look at income, you can look at education level and you can measure inequality or segregation in this space based on these uh, different uh, attributes. And the other interesting thing is that if instead of looking at adjacency, which would be like people kind of cycling or walking, you can look at commute flows as well. And what is interesting is that once you use commute and you simulate people moving with some sort of public transport network, the, the sequence of the ethnicities visited will be much different. And the time that you need as well to find more ethnicities might be uh, much different. And of course, you can also use um, phone data, you can use uh, a street network to construct uh, the most, let's say, relevant um, uh, representation that you want for your problem. Okay, so, and the whole idea behind is that depending on how much steps you need to go from one ethnicity or whatever attribute you are looking to another one, that reveals this kind of organization of the city. So like the polos of the city, the topology of the city is telling us how kind of segregated it is. It's a, it's a, it's a proxy to understand uh, spatial segregation uh, in, in, to some extent. I will give you an idea of what it looks like. Um, so in this case here, in the example of the left, we have a place, this is London, but a fictitious distribution with some uh, artificial coloring. This is not real. And in, this, in the left side here, where we have this um, is what we call class coverage time, which is the time to find the, the ethnicities available in the group. And uh, with one example, class can be anything. So in this case here, when it's randomly distributed, you can quickly find uh, a different uh, ethnicity if we start from any of the random uh, uh, areas, because the number of steps needed to find that group is on average shorter. But if you are in a city where you have a lot of gigantic clusters, for instance, if you start from this area here and you need to find, uh, let's say this yellowish, I guess, I am colorblind, so uh, you need much more steps. And what is worse is that not only much more steps, but you need to cross this whole cluster here, uh, seeing the same ethnicity before you can actually interact with a different one. And this, that is kind of the whole intuition behind this, this model. So clusters, they make it harder for you to, to find uh, other groups. It's all about the reachability of the, the individuals that we are looking at. Uh, 
if this uh, doesn't help to understand the intuition, another one you can think of, it's like you stand from one point in the map and you kind of take your uh, uh, binoculars and you look around uh, how it looks like from a starting point, um, the distribution of ethnicities uh, in your area. So to put it a bit more, more formal, uh, right. So we start with these very basic quantities, which you call, which quantity that you call uh, WIT, which is the fraction of uh, classes that we see, um, that the walkers see up to time T when it starts from a node I. So that's why I use this example here, because this is like, it's all based on the starting point. So the idea is that you start the window walk, a walker in one point, you keep moving around, and then we repeat this process across all, uh, all other nodes, so you have a more realistic estimate of the thing. And to make sure that it's just not some uh, artifact of one single realization of the thing, we take the average over like thousand realizations uh, in our case here. So from that starting node, from that start starting neighborhood, you repeat the process several times and you take the average time to find uh, the classes. That's the last quantity that we define, which is this, uh, uh, CIC here, which is pretty much the, the expected number of steps that you need to find a fraction of, uh, of the classes available in the city. And uh, it looks something like this uh, on this graph here. And by a fraction, I mean, so let's say that you have a hundred different uh, ethnic groups in your city. This is the time to find 50% of them. This is the time to find 100% of them and 10% and so on. Because you might want to develop a public policy that you don't need to reach 100% of your population, but you might need to reach 70%, 80%. And the other reason why I will ask for you uh, is that if you concentrate only here on the time to find everyone in the city and you have a very small group, a very small minority that uh, they live in a, in a concentrated area of the city, then the time to find, uh, let's say, the ethnic groups in your city will be pretty much dominated by the time to find that small one, because you need to pretty much cover almost the whole network to find that uh, that super rare or small uh, minority. Right, and then so what we do once we do this process for the um, uh, for the real system, we compare with a null model, and and the idea is that to um, to have some sort of benchmark of what we are comparing to. If, if those numbers are just artifacts from random fluctuations, or we actually seeing something that might be meaningful. And uh, the way we define a new model here is actually quite simple. It's just we reshuffle the, the neighborhoods uh, where the, the ethnicity groups are assigned. And we kind of get this kind of uh, an ensemble of several realizations of the of this city. So it's like you take the, the random neighborhood by moving the population to different areas and we repeat that several times. So in this in this paper here, we did, uh, if I'm not wrong, 20 realizations. So the random walk is this ensemble of 20 possible ways that the city can be randomly distributed. And we focus on comparing all the difference between them. Uh, and why uh, random? instead of any other, let's say, unsegregated city, it's because defining what is unsegregated is very tricky. And it might depend a lot on, uh, let's say, whatever policy, whatever um, attribute you want to maximize. Segregation in some cases is actually positive because people have a community to connect with and we don't want to take any stage, any state or, or position on what is unsegregated look like. So we go for the for random mass and the randomness is the lack of pattern. So it, it makes a lot of sense for us in this case. Right. So what we focus once we do this whole thing is what we call here this cumulative difference between the curves. So it's pretty much looking into the difference at every step, every fraction of the classes that we are observing and uh, getting the, the, the overall accumulated difference among all of those things. And then we define those uh, three main measures here, which is the uh, mean class coverage time is the average time that it takes to find uh, a fraction of the classes here, see? Then the coefficient of variation, which tells us how much it, um, the coverage time varies when I compare all the, all the nodes in the city, because 
Remember, we start from one node and we repeat the process for all the nodes in the network and we take the average. Um, and this tells how much it varies depending on the node where I start. And the last one is you can think about it as some sort of local spatial correlation. Here we are looking at the difference between neighboring nodes. So how, how what is the effect of small clusters at a very small uh, local level? Uh, um, how different they are based on these, uh, these main quantity here. But this is the core quantity that we look uh, all over the place. And the intuition here is that once you compare with the new model, if you have uh, values higher than one, it means that um, your city is more segregated or whatever quantity we are looking at here than the, the real case. And if it's, um, if it's lower, it is better than, uh, than random. Any questions so far? When you do the, the algorithm, Is the you mean the average? This average is here. Like you were saying, like you take the the starting point and you see the over all the nodes. So when you do the average over all of that, you just do the average by the for each node in the same way, or do you weight that with the area of each neighborhood or with the population of each neighborhood? No, we don't. We don't look into the the area. It's just. Yeah, it ju it's just per node. It took the look at the average per node, and we when you look at the average for a specific uh, class, uh, specific fraction. Sorry, we we look at the. It's, it's like you select the column that tells the average across all realizations for that specific um, uh, fraction, and you take the average across there. Does it help answer your question? Okay. Yeah. When you show us when you draw the map of London, you're coloring it for some neighborhoods, saying like this is the, the city of this neighborhood. But then in a neighborhood, there are many people that live in the city. Yeah. So what is the actual color that you put for here in, in this zone? People are like, what, what is that color? How do you decide this neighborhood has, has this type? Yeah, so in that example, I used a single label, which is a single color, like a, a discrete value, but you can actually assign the whole distribution. I, I will show that in a, in, a, in a bit, because that's what we, what we use for the real data. We, we don't just take one predominant class or predominant ethnicity, but we look at the whole distribution. In the case of London, we considered 240, uh, it's a combination of ethnicity with country of origin, but 240 uh, different uh, groups. All right. Okay, so let's go ahead then. So we, we do some tests with uh, some, um, some very basic new models first, some sort of sanity test. So we start with a lattice, a 2D lattice, which is a torus, so things are connected, so we minimize some issues. And the first thing that we see is that by just increasing the size of the lattice, we, we substantially increase the, the coverage times as well. Um, uh, so the larger the graph, in more classes to have a larger coverage time because obviously it's harder to find all of them. Uh, but this is like a older than me, this result. So <laughs> this is not what we are, I'm here to share. Uh, and the other thing is that um, with fewer classes, with just a few groups, you have these super large clusters that it doesn't, it doesn't even fit here in this, in this plot. I had to put them apart, which is pretty much uh, um, clusters of the same size that it takes a lot of time to get out of that cluster to be able to find uh, a different class. This is was like, as I was mentioning, just a very basic sanity test. If this process in this very basic uh, scenario can tell us anything about, um, um, about the system. And what we learned is that it, it does affect the coverage time. And then we look at different cases, uh, which is in this case here, it's a lattice again, but this time we have the borders which is what a city would look like. In this case, a lattice city, 16 by 16. And we look at five classes. One is our minority class here, which are distributed in different patterns in the center, in the corner, uh, spread, and then at, at the, at the quad, quadrants of the, of the system. And the other four classes, they have exactly the same number of, of cells. And, um, 
and are spread uniformly and they have exactly the same position. The whole idea is here, let's say we have this synthetic society where four dominant classes are evenly distributed and you have a minority one that uh, has different patterns. So here we have two things competing, which is space and the way they are distributed. So when we look at just this thing alone here, we, we don't see that much difference on the, on the coverage time alone. And sorry for the label here. Um, we've just, uh, it's just a Greek letter. I, I, I spent too much time hanging out with physicists, but I'm still recovering from that. Uh, and we see that there is no much difference when you look at here, but it spikes very quickly once you look at the, at the last class. At the which is the fifth one here we are we are thinking about talking about the time to find all the classes and here is when we start considering the the minority one to um to kind of give an estimate of how long it takes to to um to find the class so the whole idea here is that the time to find the the more classes increases in these steps you see these steps just because we have just five classes so you can't really see like a curve just an artifact of the plotting. Um, but the whole idea is that the time increases as you look at more classes. And you have a spike here because it will depend a lot on where this uh, minority class is, uh, is positioned. We also look at the standard deviation, which is the, the spatial variance. And here things change a bit more when you see the, the, the class with the spread had quadrant producing uh, more variations, but then it starts decreasing because on average, um, the time to find this, uh, this smaller one, this minority class, uh, it starts to, um, to dominate the, the coverage times. And then you look at this spatial correlation measure, we have a similar uh, effect of the, of the initial one. You can't see that much difference because on average, the number of neighbors that this minority class doesn't change that much. So it's all about surface uh, uh, coverage here. So uh, what is interesting now is when we do the, the heat map of the time, depending on where we start, and here we are looking at, uh, at the time for a certain fraction in the real system over the, the, the new model. And in this case, we choose the 70%. You can choose any value that you want, 100% and so on but 70% it was one that gave, uh, uh, made the patents here very clear. You can see the, the, the dependence on the starting point. So if you start where the, the class is, it's much shorter to find all the other ones because it's well distributed. And then here it's, uh, it's a different effect it's competing between uh, uh, the centrality of the network, because if you think of the average uh, between the centrality for a, for a squared matrix, the center tends to be the, the hotspot. Most paths will, you go through this block of nodes here. And this is what, is what is tricky because now you have topology and the patterns competing for, uh, to, to kind of control those, those effects. Um, right, and then when we put them in this projection of the, the, this spatial heterogeneity and the in diversity space, remember this is the cumulative difference. This is the difference across all the fraction of classes that we are observing. And then we see that the cluster at the corner produced the worst times to find uh, uh, the, 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 all these groups. But when you look at this other one here, when you look at the, the spatial variance and the spatial diversity, then the spread quadrant is, uh, is the worst one. And you might, you might get a bit confused, right? And the reason is that because we are having here actually, again, the patterns that we are observing, which is the, the concentration of uh, one group and the topology together competing to explain what's going on here with this average time. Uh, that's why we try to, to um, try to isolate these competing uh, effects here. And we did that by uh, now focusing on a similar uh, system now with 32 classes along the same system. So we fix the number of classes in our, in our model. And then we focus only on the shape of the, of the network, which is uh, a squared one and one with some elongated uh, shape. 
and the way we distribute them in, um, in the city. So those patterns that we distribute the population are pretty much to uh, a cluster of eight units and then a, a smaller cluster of four, a stripe of uh, four and a stripe of two. Uh, and they are both distributed randomly in the, uh, well, not randomly, but randomly following those, those patterns here in the, in the network. Right, so what we see here now, which gets a bit more clear is that the cluster of eight, which is the bigger one, has a clearer, um, higher time to find all the classes, or to find any fraction of classes that actually along the, these axes here compared to the other ones. Uh, and is higher no matter the, the, the shape of the city, uh, uniform one or an elongated one. When you look at the at the the variation, then things get a bit crazy because now you have these competing effects going on again. But what is clear is that the 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 time here to find all the classes in the system spike massively when you put this shape here. So Raphael has actually a very interesting uh, article on the CSH about the the line in the uh, is it Abu Dhabi? Is it near that? Yeah. Um, and you say that they should try a circle instead of a line, right? Because a line is one of the less optimal ways to make people interact. And I think this is showing a bit that as well. I mean, it's, you need a way more steps to, to find all the groups in your, in your fictitious city here compared to, uh, to just a squared one. Right, uh, and here is just again in that space that I was uh, showing before when you put the the average coverage time, the cumulative difference versus the this kind of local spatial correlation, and the cluster of eight is the worst again. So this tail increases quite a lot. The this difference between the neighborhood neighboring nodes as well, because that's what this thing here is measuring. Remember, it's some local uh, correlation. Here I just go like node i. What are my neighbors around node i, and what is the difference in coverage time from uh, from me to my to my neighbors? So the higher this difference, the higher the the um, uh, the more different this local composition is when you look at overall in the city. Oops. Yeah. And uh, here I put again in the same um, in the same um, space, but looking at the the spatial variance now, and the cluster is still the 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 produce the highest values in this in this system. But the good thing is that in both cases, this is stripe of two, which is a super tiny one here, makes it easier to, um, to reach all the groups in the city. But now, is this the kind of city that we should have? That's a very different question. Uh, some people might want, some community might want some small clustering to feel part of some community. So this is uh, to be debated. But in respect to topology alone, it is the one that facilitates uh, reachability and interaction among groups. Uh, okay, now what about the real world? How this thing, does this thing help us understand anything about real cities? So what we do is we focus on some metropolitan areas in the US and the UK. And here is what I was talking at the beginning. We assigned this, uh, now it's a, a whole distribution of, um, of the individuals that live in an area, which we call here uh, M. And uh, for the case of the US, the highest that we managed to find was uh, 16 race ethnic groups from the census, the most uh, detailed that we could find. In the UK, it was up to 250, which is the combination of country of origin with uh, ethnicity. And what is, what is interesting about this thing here, if you look at most papers about segregation, you often find five groups because it's easier to compute for five groups, right? But you are losing so much information when when you convert all of this gigantic vector of information into a single label, which is white, black, or so on. Um, and uh, especially if you are targeting minority, you're losing all this granularity here. And uh, this was one of the main motivations to go this in this direction here, because it doesn't matter how many groups you are putting, you can put as many as you want. And, um, and, and the whole idea is that even if you have different ones, as far as they are not too crazy apart, you can still say something meaningful about those cities because at the end, we are not comparing the cities like London 
and uh, New York directly, we are comparing how London is far from its random version and how New York is far from its random version. And uh, that can, can make a more meaningful and, and realistic comparison between those cities instead of, instead of just looking at raw numbers of them. Okay, so um, here we do an example of, uh, uh, of London. We plot the, again, the spatial variance, the, the, the local uh, spatial heterogeneity, the accumulative one, the variance and the mean time as well. In all the cases, the real city uh, behaves in a way that the average time and the average variance it's higher in the in the real case compared to the compared to the new model. And what is interesting about London here is that we can quite see very clearly when you make the the, the map is that the the range of values is quite high. You have placings in London that it's equivalent to the to the to the new model is almost random. It is this region here in this color, and there are areas like this one here that it takes like six times longer compared to a randomized city to find. Uh, those ethnic groups. And of course, when you look at those maps here, it's always important to also take those uh, numbers in consideration because maps, they are very informative, but they can also be misleading. I think is is you should use them as a, um, <clears throat> a combined analysis because they help very easily to identify where are the hotspots, where we, we have very segregated regions, but you need to look at those, these kind of distributions as well, so what you are taking into account. And here we are again looking at the 70% of the population to produce this map. So it's the coverage time at some specific, at this specific fraction of classes. And this is the average over uh, all, all nodes for each node. Sorry, go ahead. It, it jumps from neighborhood to neighborhood. We did not incorporate the street network, but uh, we could use that, yes. Something that I didn't mention at the beginning was th this work was like very methodological. Uh, the idea was to build the method. So, and this is this was kind of the, one of the ways to test the method. But if you want to really uh, dive into uh, what is the most realistic way to do this analysis? You can definitely go crazy. You can go with a walking network or cycling network, incorporate all of those active mobility networks. Uh, on the reshuffling process, for instance, instead of, instead of just randomly, you can use the um, account for capacity as well, because here you're not accounting for capacity, but you should do that if you're doing a, a randomization of a real city, because not every neighborhood can accommodate all those residents, right? And, um, but yeah, you can definitely make it more, more precise. Uh, and, and the good thing is that we can produce these maps for any city that we analyze along with the, the, uh, the statistics. So this gives us a very kind of detailed description of, of, of a city, if you really want to dive in a specific city and even producing maps here like this one, at, um, at a different fraction of classes, it's just a matter of selecting, clicking one button, and you can produce the map at, at a different one. So I think it's quite useful for policymakers if they want to test uh, some, some, some policy at different levels. The other thing is that now we can compare uh, all these cities here by, I would call it, a bit more fair way, because we are looking at the difference that they are from their corresponding new model and not just comparing them directly based on raw models. So if they are close to, to uh, this region here, it means that on average, you don't have that much difference in the, in the local neighborhoods. Uh, the, the time from node I to node J is, is quite similar, it's fairly similar. So you have small clusters in the, in the, in the city, but not super large ones. And here, if you are at the bottom here for the mean time, it means that on average, it's, uh, it's fairly easy to find uh, the groups in the in the city, but if you are, of course, at the very extreme, like this one here, it means it takes a lot of time to find those uh, those groups, and also um, they vary a lot in in respect to where you start. So you might have some very large clusters of the same group here, and this is the 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 variance which tells uh, overall when you look at all the nodes how far the best place to the worst place is in this, in this map. 
I put some examples here, um, like for instance, Sheffield and Manchester, they look quite similar. If you look at the spatial patterns here, and have a very similar range of, of values as well. Um, there's also the case here of, uh, of Boston in Los Angeles. Boston has a very high uh, uh, spatial diversity, which means that they have some quite large clusters. Which you can see here, the city is pretty much split apart, like the super hard to reach region here, where on average it takes a lot of times if you start from here compared to other ones. And you have this hotspot here in Los Angeles as well. Another case is, um, ah, and just remember that we are again looking at this, uh, this fraction here at this fixed, fixed valley. Another example is uh, uh, London and New York. What is interesting here is that um, for New York, if you want to look at the, the, um, the local, this local spatial diversity is much higher and New York has these very clear uh, areas where it's pretty much like Bronx, for instance, is mostly African-Americans and we have other areas where it's more like hipster, more, more, um, more mixed, but you have some very clear gigantic clusters uh, in, in, in New York that is quite dominant from a, <clears throat> uh, by a, a specific ethnicity. In the case of London, it is slightly different. You still have these clusters, but London overall, it's, uh, it's, it's fairly easier to find, uh, to find uh, the other groups because the clusters are much smaller, which is what, why we see them at the opposite um, areas here. Oh. Yeah, no. go ahead. No, I mean, I'm passing by the so we're not taking into account those factors. No, we are not taking into account in physical barriers, no. Oh, I mean, this is, uh, we are looking here at this red spot here, but inside this red spot, there are actually like thousands of neighborhoods. Those are the, the metropolitan areas, the, the biggest metropolitan areas in, uh, in the US and the UK. So we're talking about here populations of uh, from 18 million to 10 million, like super large areas, which is one of the reasons why we see all of these uh, clusters. This is most likely the city center or some other region. And, and and this is most likely some sort of uh, uh, I I would guess some some countryside with some some smaller uh, cluster diverse cluster here. This is this is again those competing effects of the distribution of the population with the topology of the network, and that depends a lot on um, on how they play together, depending on the city. I mean, to to really tell you what is causing this here, you need to really dig. In, in, in this city, look at what are the distributions of the population here, what is here, and uh, why it makes so much so much difference. Well, it's up to twice here in this case, uh, depending on where you start your your walk. I'm not, I'm not sure if I if I answered your question. Yes, no. Yeah, the, well, to answer directly is that I don't know why it is this. Because then you need to look at the composition of the distribute of the population in these areas to tell. Like the same happens in London. You have in the eastern part of London very uh, single sort of ways in the streets. So like everybody is like white and like typical British families in the super rich part. Yeah. And then you have a like a spot in the center. It's not super super red, but you have a spot in the center that I think is kind of war or the city of London. That is super low. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I lived here in, in East London for a while, so it's one of the most diverse uh, areas there. And um, at least some, it made sense to me when I look at this map. But it's important to remember that um, this is just one snapshot of that specific fraction 0 0.7 that we that we were looking yeah okay this yeah so it, it can it can change if you if you look at 80% 90% this map will look a bit different yeah uh -huh. 
how dependent are these results on this number of neighborhoods that you have? It's, a, it's like changing the language, like you were saying, like about the system being changed. Yeah. And both terms are so broad, right? Like the problems and like <laughs> you're Very good question. Things. Yeah. Yeah, very good question. Uh, we did we did we did this test for for London, uh, which is it, it's a method that you have these super long uh, random walks, uh, like twenty million, fifty million steps, and you look at some specific attribute of the random walk. And you look at this uh, long range correlations, it's called like the trended fluctuation analysis. The whole idea is that uh, you want to see if you, those correlations hold, like degree correlation in this case is attribute correlation hold once you keep doing this process over and over and over for a long time. So what we did was we did this process for um, the highest granularity, which is, uh, how is it called now? Something track in, in the UK. So you have the LSMO, LSO, MO, like you have like at least three different uh, granular granularities of the, the neighborhood size. And we noted that the difference was not so big, which is one of the reasons why we, uh, we chose to, to use this random walk because there are some differences, they are small, but to some extent it's some sort of uh, spatial scale uh, insensitive. It still preserves these correlations. As far as you don't go too crazy, as far as you don't compare, let's say, one neighborhood of one city that is a few hundred meters to 10 kilometers, then I think it gets it gets meaningless. But if if those areas are like fairly uh, similar uh, in size, um, it's it's it doesn't influence that much the results. We look at the the average distance traveled. We look at the um, the average um, I don't remember exactly which ones right now, but they hold very similar depending on the scale of the city that we use. Is it is it what you you asking? Right. Okay. Good. Different borders. Mm. Well, I mean, the, the border has always some effect, right? Because it, it, it influences your, your, the area that you are exposed to. Uh, I think it depends. It, it, it depends on the topology that you are looking. If you look at adjacency, maybe not that much because you are, we are, here we are looking at jumping from one neighborhood to the other one and the border effect is kind of not that, that meaningful. But if you're looking at maybe walking um, walking distance where every detail in the border uh, uh, matters, and if you have a train line separating the thing, it's gonna make a huge difference, then yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think I can just wrap up now. And then, yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah, so. Okay, and just to, to the whole idea was that with, with this kind of approach, you can have detailed statistics of a city. You can do this between city comparisons as well by how far they are from their corresponding null model. And you can do this within city analysis as well. Uh, and just to, to sum up, the whole thing is that segregation is very robust. All the cities that we analyzed, we, we, we found segregation, we found those uh, special patterns uh, being barriers for people to interact uh, in the city. Another aspect is that you have these competing effects that it's really hard to, to remove, which is the graph topology and the cluster size going on there. The other one is that we attempted to give a number to a place, but uh, it's very hard to give a single number to, to, to identify a city when you have competing effects there. So we, we learned that sometimes and very often a single measure is not enough. You need to look at the problem from different dimensions. Um, and diffusion, I hope I convinced you that it's very useful and powerful to look into these dynamics that happen in the distribution of some features in, in the city. 
And uh, this whole thing is, is super flexible. You can plug in whatever data you want. You can build the graph the way you want. And in principle, it will change the results, of course, because we'll be looking at different things, but the, the, the framework itself should, should, should hold. Uh, and the last thing that I wanted to say is just that what I'm going to do next. So um, one of the things that, that I come here to, to the complexity hub to talk about was like, it's shocking how we know little about the effects of extreme uh, weather events. And my whole plan is to try to use part of this framework to study how um, uh, extreme weather events will affect uh, urban segregation and inequalities, how it will affect um, uh, climate migrants as well, in, in the sense that uh, uh, the flows that we see over the world, how they will change, if they will change at all because of extreme weather events unequal access to health systems as well because of those issues and uh, conflicts which uh, are induced by uh, migration or can induce um, migration. Yes, that's it. Those are the people that I collaborate with and uh, thank you for listening. <laughs>